Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. On today's episode, we have NEPSAC AAA head coach Andrew Gale. Andrew Gale is the head coach of New Hampton School in New Hampshire, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thanks, Corey. I appreciate you having me. Yes, yeah, so we've known each other a couple of years now, but I really don't know your background and where you're from. So can you fill me in on you know where you grew up and uh, why you picked basketball uh, over other sports? Absolutely. So I actually grew up in Williston, Vermont, which is a, a suburb just outside of Burlington. Um, basketball was always kind of my, my passion with football. Uh, when I was in high school, I ended up actually breaking my hip my sophomore year. So I could never play football again. So then it was all basketball. And that was just something that totally consumed me in, in my free time. Um, and then, you know, I, I debated playing collegiately, you know, at a low division three level, but I ended up deciding to go and stay close to home and went to the University of Vermont and, and try to keep basketball in my life for a little bit. And then, you know, after two years, it, it felt weird not being a part of a team. And I ended up getting a internship with the men's team that led to a manager spot, which then the manager spot led to a grad assistant position there. So I was at UVM for, for four years. Uh, and during that stretch, we had a great run of success. Uh, my last year there, uh, we made it to the tournament, I believe it was 2017, uh, and we played Purdue in the first round. We had the longest winning streak in the country heading into the tournament. We were a 14 seed, and I still believe if our senior captain didn't tear his ACL, we probably would have snuck that one out from the Boilermakers, but, um, you know, from there, I went on to New Hampton straight after, after graduating grad school was an assistant under Nick Whitmore for two years. And then I'm, I'm now heading into my second year. Uh, sorry, this is my second year of being a, the head coach for our top program. Gotcha. What did you learn being at Vermont that you've applied to New Hampton? Um, something that I thought that the Vermont staff did a great job with is they really tried to build relationships with kids. Uh, and I, I think that especially now with how monetized everything is in college athletics, uh, people kind of forget that they are still young adults learning and growing. And, and the fact that they were able to build relationships with the kids and then go out and go into these high pressure situations when it almost felt relaxed and huddles because of that. Uh, I thought that was the most impressive thing, the way that they were able to manage all the kids coming in. Cause a lot of them were the best players in their high school, you know, Vermont's not getting, you know, top 100 players every year, but what they are getting are, are the kids who were the best team at their local high school or really good players at the prep school level and, and getting them to buy into a common theme and be able to sacrifice for one another was, was extremely impressive. And honestly, I think that's what leads to most of the success there at that program. Okay. Now you did uh, your four years at a D1 program. Why go to prep school? What was your motivation there versus trying to go to another um, college program? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. I think a lot of young people that are kind of in this business, uh, you know, I struggled actually after my fourth year at Vermont. I didn't know if I wanted to do college basketball anymore. It was just such a grind. And, you know, I didn't make a whole lot of money and, you know, overall happiness and how, how much time it took. Uh, I actually explored getting into becoming an AD with my with my graduate degree. And then the New Hampton job kind of came around. And when I stepped foot back in the gym, uh, I was kind of like, okay, yeah, this is, this is what I was meant to do. I just need a little break to kind of realize that. But the, the main thing with, with the prep school route that, that made me so interested in it was the fact that you get to help kids get to the level that you've already been to and provide that insight to them of, you know, playing at a scholarship level, whether division one, division two, uh, is extremely hard and even playing at most of these D3 programs is extremely challenging and you know I think we see it every year uh, where a division two or division three program upsets a division one program whether it's preseason or one of those one of those play games uh, where they where they play down a level and it's uh, it's really hard to do so providing insight and working with younger kids to kind of help them 
be prepared for that transition was was the main reason why I went to this level. Gotcha. And this probably helps you recruiting players to New Hampton, saying you've been to the D1 level. You know what it requires to be at that level or to play at that level. So that's probably great insight that is valuable for you when you talk to your kids, right? Yeah. And it's 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 cool because my my other assistants played division one and division two basketball. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to be at a program that cares so much about basketball that we can run it like a, a collegiate program. Uh, so that's part of the that's part of the sell to the families is, you know, obviously I have multiple jobs here at the school. I'm not just focused on the basketball piece, but I try to create as much of a collegiate level, uh, you know, atmosphere and environment as possible, whether that's the weightlifting schedule. You know, we do yoga at our school twice a week for our guys. Uh, the early morning practices, all that kind of stuff, and, and having that insight to know what it, how it looks, and and what it what it looks like, and how it works, I think you know has has helped me a lot in, in convincing kids to come to New Hampton. Gotcha. Now, uh, for people that don't know about New Hampton, tell us a little bit about the school itself. Uh, it's maybe it's basketball history, and then what's your pitch to kids. So, if I'm looking at your school and a couple other uh, similar programs, why should I come to New Hampton? Yeah, so actually New Hampton is is a great balance of academics and athletics. You know, uh, I think we see so many prep schools popping up now and, and like it looks like they're just in a trailer and they're in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, I was even watching something on 60 Minutes once where they there a prep school web page that was convincing kids to come over from Africa was using MIT's photos on their web page to make it look like they had these great classrooms. But New Hampton's been around. This is actually our bicentennial. This is our 200th year of being a school, uh, which is an incredible accomplishment. You know, we have the AP, the IB level courses to prov uh, start providing our kids, you know, collegiate level instruction. Uh, and it's just a it's it's a place that's been around forever and has had a lot of success. And we've sent kids to Ivy League schools, you know, NESCAC schools, high academic D3 programs. Uh, and there's just always been a huge support for the basketball program too. Um, you know, we've kind of, we were an all PG school for a little while uh, and that was kind of more the athletic piece. And then we went back to doing, you know, all sort, all levels. Um, so, you know, for our program, we're not like the IMGs and the Montverds where their second team is all post-grads. Uh, we actually have kids on our team who are post-grads and we actually have a kid on our team this year as a freshman. So it's every single grade that's included into one team. Um, and the school's had a ton of success. We've been around. I mean, we were part of the original top tier team in the NEPSAC. I believe we're the only one that's really kind of maintained there the whole time. You know, Winchenden, MCI, were all really high level programs with New Hampton at one point, And then they all kind of took a step back. And then that's when the NMHs and the Brewsters of the world kind of joined our league and took off. Uh, but we've kind of been the constant. Um, you know, I, I like to... Uh, our motto here is, you know, we were the OG, we were the original before most of these schools kind of came in and started doing this thing. Um, and we had a great run of success in the, in the early and late nineties. Uh, we won a championship in 2003 and then we kind of went on this long drought until we won one last year. Um, but that kind of leads me into the second part of your question. Um, you know, my philosophy and what I tell kids is New Hampton is it's, doing a PG year or going to a prep school has a selfish aspect to it, right? You're, you're going to a school that helps prepare you individually to go on to college. Uh, so there is a little bit of selfishness in the decision that you're making. And what I like to say is I want to help you be selfish, but I also want to teach you what it's like to be at the next level where you have to be unselfish. Um, and, and for me, it's all about skill development and player development. That's always been kind of our motto. Um, and we don't get the top 100 kids, right? And, you know, that's Brewster gets those guys, Mount Verde, IMG, La Loom, all these other schools get those type of players. But the way that I see it is we like to bring in kids and then develop them into the top 100 players. You know, we may not recruit top 100, but we develop top 100 kids. And, you know, for me, trying to build up that, a, a, on a resume, right? Like I can say that, but this is only year two for me. You know, I think we've seen it with Alex Caravan, who, you know, was kind of a little bit of an unknown, like people knew he was really good, but did people think he was, you know, that good? And now he's a top 60 player in the country for the junior class. And the same thing goes for Kyle Hicks, 
uh, who's really blossomed and, and developed. And even the kid, Evan Guillory, who's a two-year kid for us, who went from having no offers to all of a sudden going to Vermont. And I think Vermont got an absolute steal. Um, so that's kind of our, like the way that we see it is we want to develop kids, but my philosophy and, and the way that I teach players things is I, I go by the term love and there's three steps to love. The first step is you need to love yourself. And, and the first part of loving yourself is you need to understand that you're trying something new. You're trying something different. You're going to make mistakes. Most of these kids, it's the first time you've, you've lived away from home. So you got to love yourself and love everything that you're doing. The second part of that is you need to love the process. I need guys that want to get in the gym, that want to work out, that want to do yoga. I don't want guys that when practice is over, they walk out of the gym. I want guys that stay and work on little extra things and, and try to get better and seek the extra help. And then the last step is you need to love your teammates and, and the legacy. So, you know, New Hampton has a, a long line of history. What do you want your legacy to be? That's a question I ask our guys every year. What do you want your one year, your two years, your three years at New Hampton to be? And when you come back to this place, what do you want people to know about you? And when you love your teammates and love yourself and love the process, it's really hard to, to be beaten, right? Like if, if you have total buy-in from 14 guys and all 14 guys can do those three things, it's really, really hard to be beaten. And it's, and it's really attainable to get a championship. Yeah. And you use that in your first year to win a, a prep school champion, national championship. I mean, that's, that's, you know, I got nowhere to go, but down, right. Or unless yeah, you keep exactly. just repeating, almost, repeating. Yeah. I almost set the bar too high for myself. I don't really know what to do from here. So, you know, and I always describe New Hampton to folks, I say, Hey, it's, you know, beautiful campus, uh, great academics, you know, great competition, great teammates, great coaches. But one thing I also say is that it was good enough of a place for Bobby Knight to send his son there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you and ever use that in your recruiting pitches? I actually, so I, I don't necessarily just because I don't have a relationship with Pat that okay. I feel comfortable using that. But what I do say is, you know, we have Rex Walters who played in the NBA for nine years and was at, at Kansas and he sent his kid there and he's thinking about sending his second, his second son here to do a, a PG year. And, you know, he's an NBA assistant, you know, we, we've had Jim Beheim has sent his son here. Um, you know, uh, Danny Manning sent his son here. So uh, college coaches trust this place to really develop their kids and put them in a situation to be successful. Yeah, that's great. And mind you, Witt was there, I think, when yeah. my first podcast, he told me the story about how Coach Knight talked to him and, and Pat chose it. Yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, let's ask about this COVID. Obviously, right now, uh, it's, it's a challenging time. We were discussing before this started that you were having you know troubles playing games and everything. Aside from the game playing, what's it been like with you trying to place your players this year? It's really challenging because, uh, you know, with the new rules and everything going on, a lot of these colleges don't even know what their roster looks like at the moment, you know, where you have in the standard year, you have the progression, all right, my seniors are leaving, you know, these kids might be uh, transferring all this stuff. So you kind of have a pretty clear picture of what you need to bring in where now this year where everybody gets the extra year of eligibility, there's the, the no sit out transfer rule. It's really hard for these colleges to go out and say, all right, this is what we need. And a lot of them too are going to play the transfer portal and they're going to say all right I would rather bring in kids who already know what it's like to play collegiate basketball into our program than maybe bringing in a kid that's going to be log jammed with all the freshmen that we brought in last year and how are they going to compete for time and, and basically our guys essentially would be losing a year of eligibility in that sense because they would probably play behind the freshmen that they've already brought in to a certain extent so it's a, it's a challenging thing and honestly it goes back to my point with the kid Evan Guillory I think he's an A-10 player but he just kind of slipped through the cracks. And I think we're going to see a lot of really good, talented players go to low major schools, mid-major programs, uh, be scholarship division two players and, and, and see a huge spike in that too. So it's a challenge and it's hard, uh, but it's also, you know, uh, you can't really blame the college coaches either because it's not like they're doing it on purpose. They're just kind of stuck in this limbo and this holding pattern. Uh, so it's really hard. And I think honestly, if, if a lot of our guys want to wait, I mean, some of our guys might be making decisions in June, July, depending on right. what they feel comfortable doing. Yeah, I've said this a lot. I'll, I'll repeat myself again, but 
this is going to make the game better, right? You're probably having a lot of guys not playing D1 that probably shouldn't have been playing anyway. And maybe there's some guys playing D1 that's going to slip down to D2, like you said, and down to D3. So you might have 500 kids not playing college ball that maybe they shouldn't be playing in the first place. So this could really help the game. And of course, it's not fair for the class of 21. But, you know, the, the statement I always say, Andrew, is they've had 18 years to work on their basketball resume or work on their grades. Like this, this did not just happen overnight. Yeah, these NCAA rule changes happened overnight. But what were you doing the past 18 years? And, you know, your kids like Alex Caravan and other top 300 players, they're all going to be fine. It's after you drop off and start, you know, going beyond that, that coaches are going to have questions. And if I'm a D1 assistant, do I take a 22-year-old man that's been the eighth guy in an SEC team or take a chance on a high school kid who might get homesick or might not be able to handle the rigors and just transfer after that? So I, I feel for these college programs. And some of them uh, are just doing transfers. Some are still sticking with high school guys. But unfortunately, you're going to have to spend a lot of bandwidth finding out which programs those – those are and then do you have the right guy for them so I, I can't imagine the pressure that you're feeling probably right now from kids that don't have offers yet from parents that have put their trust in you and their dollars at New Hampton to get this done because that's the number one thing about prep school is you're going to place kids right. and now that the market's changed so much and it's so much more difficult that all falls on your shoulders so what are your conversations like with the kids and with the families? Is it, is it to be patient? Is it to maybe take something below, you know, a level lower than maybe you thought or dreamed of having, or how are those conversations going right now? Well, that's a great question. Cause I actually got some practice with it in our class of 2020s because we win the championship and these guys create all these, but this buzz are our guys who have gone on uh, who were who graduating last year. And, you know, two of our starters who I thought were division one players ended up going to any 10 division two schools on scholarships and our, our best graduating player last year probably deserved to play at a much higher level, but is at Northeastern and has won rookie of the week, three out of the four or three out of the five or six times. So, you know, I think there, there are some pros and cons to this. And that's why I, when I talk to the families and when I talk to the kid, I always, I always say, the options you have now, do you feel comfortable with what you have? And if you feel comfortable and it feels like a fit, you need to pull the trigger because in a year like this, you don't have the guarantees that you normally would because these schools will probably not wait as long as possible because there's all these other options out there of, of kids, whether they're transferring or all these other seniors who already did the postgrad year, just like you trying to fill those, those spots. So if you feel comfortable, you need to pull it. But if there's something out there that you don't love, uh, you shouldn't just do it to do it, right? Because I think if you do that, you set yourself up for failure. Um, and I mean, think of how many great kids have gone on, great basketball players have gone on to programs that they probably shouldn't have and their career just kind of fizzled out because they weren't supported. And my, and my thing too, when I place a kid, I always say, do I trust the coaching staff to stick with you? Because I know you're, I mean, it's crazy to think that these kids going into your program are not going to make mistakes. So do I feel like the coaching staff believes in you enough that when you're going through your freshman lull, they're going to stick by you and they're not going to sit up in their, in their coaches meeting, say, we need to recruit over Jimmy because Jimmy's not playing up to the level. Like I need to feel like our guys are being supported and able to grow while also make mistakes and, and really try to develop at the program. And it just goes back to my original point of, you know, it's so money driven now and these guys are so focused and, and worried about losing their jobs if they're not winning games and they're not bringing in, you know, the right student athletes for their program. And then they're, then it's like, all right, like all loyalties are lost at that point because I need to, I need to take care of myself. Uh, so making sure I try to keep kids out of that type of situation. Cause I just don't think it's very healthy. Right. And now with all this going on with the difficulty you've had, placing your 2020 guys, what you're seeing right now with 2021, is this changing how you're recruiting kids for next year's team? Yeah, I actually, uh, most of the kids that we're recruiting are actually two-year kids, uh, just so that we can try to get through this little bottleneck of, of athletes. I think even the class of 2022, to your point earlier, like the top 300 guys are going to be fine, but even the class of 2022, if you're in that that in between range and you're a fringe division one scholarship division two guy, it's still murky in the class of 2022. So 
I'm actually trying to, to get younger kids and especially a lot of these kids now who are juniors currently who are technically in the class of 2022 need to reclass mm -hmm. because you need to get the classroom time. You need to get back seeing face-to-face -face instruction. You need to get your, your two years back of, of, or well, your year back of high school basketball, as well as AAU, get the extra year of exposure on the circuit or whatever AAU program you're in. So that's kind of why I've transitioned more to the younger guys, because I think that this is going to have a lasting impact beyond just this year. Gotcha. What about uh, a second team? Have you guys discussed that due to the demand out there for, for kids wanting prep schools? Yeah, we, we've thought about it as a, as a school. Um, but I think my, my biggest thing is I need to feel comfortable that we can actually provide for the kids. Because I think the worst thing that I could do is I could say, yeah, we're going to take a second team and take all these kids and then not have the best coach possible that we can for the second team, not be able to set up uh, exposure events or events where they can play other really good teams. Because I think the worst thing that could happen is I convince them to come here. They play really bad competition and they're not getting coached. And then I convince these kids to spend money, spend an extra year. And then I have to go place them and they don't really have great film or people don't think that they're as good as they really are. So it's, it's something that it's kind of in the works, but I need to feel comfortable that we can bring in enough talented kids, whether that's division two or division three level guys for that program or that team, as well as making sure that we have the right coaching staff that can help them develop. Because like I said, the biggest thing for me is player development. And if I'm preaching player development at the top team and I can't provide it to the second team, then I'm not fulfilling my promise. Yeah. And to me, I know there's some teams out there doing it successfully, but for me looking at it from the outside, I just see the bandwidth it would take. Cause you know, the bandwidth it takes to place just one team, right. let alone, you know, a full other team I, to me, I just think, especially, I mean, cause I used to do placement when I was a high school coach, I used to call college coaches and it was miserable back then. I can't imagine now trying to do it too and the expectations of the kids on the second team you know are those tempered or are they realistic so yeah and then, and then and then and then at that point too are you looking at carrying 20 guys in the fall and in the spring when you're not in season trying to develop them how do you split up the core time how do you make sure everybody's getting the same you know the same value provided it's a it's a real challenging thing to try to navigate yeah. And some guys do have it figured out. And I think other guys are trying it and they'll learn through, through ups and downs. I think other coaches are avoiding it. So it's just, it's a case by case pr process to me. I think if I was in the shoes though, I'd, I would need very good coaches, like you said, and I would need to know I could place everybody. And in this new environment to me, I just, it's going to be, it's going to be great to see if these guys can get placed from these second teams. Cause if I'm a parent, that's the first question I'm asking. Right? Oh, if I'm going to be one of those second team kids. hundred percent. You're probably the youngest coach in AAA, right? Yes. What advantage does that give you? I think it gives it, it has a lot of disadvantages in terms of me not having the um, connection to college coaches like someone like Jason Smith or John Carroll or Jerry Quinn or Witt. You know, all those guys have great connections and they've been establishing those connections for a long time. But where I think I have the advantage is I can really relate to these kids. And when I sit there and I joke around with them, like I, I'm not that much older than them. Like I could be your older brother. And like it allows us to have more candid conversations. And it doesn't feel like there's this huge disconnect from coach and player. Like I'm thinking a completely different game than they are. And I try to make it centered around the players. This is a player run program. And I think it's helped me kind of learn a lot because I think when I first came in I tried to assert myself as like an older guy would like I know more than you do and, and x y and z where I actually developed and said you know what hey I just got to show them that I, I'm I'm young too in this process and like I'm learning just like you guys are and we're going to kind of go through this together and I'm going to give you the knowledge I have and I'm going to be open to whatever it is that you have to provide to me and I kind of understand maybe more what's going on in a young man's life right now than maybe somebody who's, you know, 20 years older than me, 30 years older than me. Um, so I think it allows me to kind of connect with them on, on, on that level. Uh, and maybe it's the new school philosophy where I, it's like the NBA now where it's a player's league. Our program is, is player driven. You know, I help steer the boat, but they determine how far we go. They're, they're the one that's putting in the effort to give the boat power. I'm going to just try to help them navigate throughout the whole season. 
Gotcha. No, that makes sense. Um, let me ask you this. You have a lot of people reaching out to you every day, mm -hmm. kids wanting to be on your team because it is, it's a, it's a known brand. When you get all those emails, what do you look for in a kid? Like not even this year, but like what's going to be a pure deal killer and what's going to be a kid where you're going to keep continuing the dialogue to learn more about them. What are some of those characteristics? I think, I think the biggest thing is the kids should have people that are there to support them. If I get an email from a kid uh, and it's just kind of them and it's just kind of a bunch of information that doesn't really tell me anything and it's a uh, and it's a highlight tape of them in the first five or six clips aren't very good. I, I erase that email. I'm not really having that kind of dialogue with kids. Now, the biggest advice I would give to kids trying to get placed, if you have somebody, you know, like yourself, who's helping them get placed or they have an AU coach or a high school coach that really believes in them, that is more likely going to at least get me to read fully and watch the highlight tape completely. Uh, because if if I can relate to somebody who's in a similar position as me and they think that their kid can play at my level, then I'm more likely to read it uh, and, and kind of go through that. And then it just starts the dialogue from there is just, hey, no, I appreciate you passing this along. Uh, you know, you look good on the highlight tape, hopefully. Um, and I would love to start a dialogue. And, and basically what I do is I send them some game film of us and say, hey, how do you see yourself fitting in here? And I almost try to test, test their college or their, their basketball IQ. What do you think about what we run? What do you think about our defense? How do you see yourself fitting into our style? Uh, and if they're taking the time and effort to do that, to see how they can fit in, then I think it's a kid worth me pursuing because they're obviously dedicated enough to watch it, see what we have. And they're not just falling in love with the name of New Hampton or, hey, I'm just going to go there because it's it's this place that's highly recommended. They're actually putting in the effort. And, and the other advice I would give, don't uh, don't tell a college or don't tell a, a prep school coach that you're a high level prospect or use the same adjectives over and over again. Like if you're using generic adjectives like I'm hardworking and, uh, you know, no one uh, is in the gym more than me. To me, that's those are very broad statements that I don't I don't think you're good enough because you're just saying that you're going to work really hard and you don't have a real skill set. So I don't, I don't feel like you're really going to fit into what we're trying to do. I think every single email I get from a kid is like, I'm the hardest working kid in the gym. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Show me then. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I actually got an email yesterday too, where I asked um, a parent reached out to me and uh, you know, I have a form email I send back to kids and I said, Hey, I need a highlight video. And she wrote back goes, well, you can search him on this website. All right. All right. Now, if just a suggestion to every kid and parent out there, don't make a coach search or don't make a guy like me search, make it as easy as possible for people. Like I did search for the website and it was just academic highlights, no game highlights. So I said, Hey, I nor any prep school coach can take you seriously or even give you a fair assessment until we see your skill set. And that's another thing too. Have you been seeing in lieu of highlight tapes, actual kids doing individual workouts or two on twos. Have you seen that? And have you made decisions based on that? Yeah. A, a lot of it is, uh, workout tapes, uh, one-on-one -on -one with a trainer. Um, it's really hard for me to assess. And I always make the same joke to our guys. I can make myself look good in the highlight tape too. Like if I have something yeah. that, that can fill me and make me look good and they cut out every time I dribble the ball off my foot or every oh. miss I have, uh, I could look like, you know, LeBron James out here. Well, actually, I can't dunk, so maybe not LeBron James. But, you know, if, if, if you're putting something out there that doesn't really tell me what you do and you look like every other kid that plays basketball that has a trainer, it, it, it doesn't help me differentiate you from everybody else. And there is such a high influx of kids. You know, I'll get 20 emails a week of kids that want to come here. Mm -hmm. And very rarely do I really – pursue a kid beyond a first or second contact because it's just hard. Like I, I need to feel like you're into it and what really separates you from everybody else that's applying. And that's, that's that big question uh, that, that you kind of brought up. And that's where it helps to come from trusted sources. Like if I'm reaching out to you or a college coach or an AU guy, you've got a relationship with, you know, they're not going to waste your time. Yeah. That if they're reaching out to you and that is worth taking time to, 
to look into. So it's a good lesson for kids is to have an advocate. Yeah. And, and I think the other huge thing with that too, is I think people forget at the prep school level, we're not college basketball coaches. You know, I teach four sections of math. I work in, I work in a dorm. I have practice every day. I'm in the weight room at least two or three times, two or three times a week. Uh, I have seven kids that I'm their advisor. So I'm like their parent away from home. So if you're making it hard for me in the very limited time that I have to figure out who you are, you're not worth my time because you're not here in the, in the flesh and in person where I really am devoted to you. So at that point, it's like, all right, I, I'm sure you're great. I'm sure you're an awesome kid. I'm sure you have these big dreams. I don't think this is a place for you because I just can't, I can't find out a way to do that right now. Yeah. What is something you wish the, the general basketball public knew about prep schools that they just, they don't seem to get? I wish that prep schools could get rid of the stigma of, you know, it's for kids who didn't do well in school or it's uh, for kids who got in trouble somewhere. Yeah. Because I think I run into that a lot with people from the Midwest, people from the South and even the Pacific Northwest. Um, just because they don't really understand what it is. And, and really, it is a, it's a college atmosphere. It's collegiate. Now, the other problem is, is there are prep schools, like we were talking about earlier, who are pop-up prep schools and are fraudulent. Don't call those prep schools. They're yeah, not they're schools. schools. They are academies. Yeah, yeah. academies, yeah. and, and they're, they're trying to steal your money. So I think those, those kind of places affect us because everybody then thinks that that's how we are. But then when when I, when I sit down and I talk to families, and I say, yeah, this is our 200th year of being a school. And I can show you a 200 page yearbook where we have our school with our students in front of the, in front of the steps of our admissions office every single year for the last 200 years. It's like, okay, this is a, this is a real deal. And, you know, we have people here who teach here who, you know, are doctors, like we have a, a science teacher here who has her doctorate in biology. Uh, and she went to Princeton and um, Cornell and, you can get that level of education at the high school level. You just got to look for it. And you got to make sure you're going to the right spot to find it. Yeah. One of the things I like to say about schools like yours is you have a Wikipedia page. Yes, that helps. Not, anyone can make a Wikipedia page, but like, you're not going to have, it's that's one of the, the cute little things I say um, that separates places. That's one of many, but there are some good academies out there. It's just, even if it's a good academy, it could shut down tomorrow if the finances don't work or a couple kids get sick or a couple kids don't come back from break or vacation or who knows, could be a million things. And what I tell families on that is, yeah, there's two different things. There's prep schools, which are brick and mortar and there's basketball academies. There's some fine ones out there, but you got to find them. Right. And then you got to know you get what you pay for it too. And ask, you know, these five tough questions to make sure you're comfortable after you ask them. And, um, Mike Hart of St. Andrews always says a great line. He goes, I want you to have a principal and a prom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so, deep. it's a good point. And, uh, and some of these, some of these academies don't even, their kids don't even go to school. And, but that's fine. Not every kid wants to go to school for a postgraduate. Yeah. They don't even have to. Right. right. But that tells me about the client, the kid too. Like if you don't want to go to school for this year, like what, why do you want to go to college? Yeah. I know it's to go pro, and, but is that the reality? Yeah. And even then it's hard, it's hard to get placed because a lot of these schools are like, what, well, what'd you do this last year academically that makes us feel confident that you can be successful in college at our institution. And that's where, you know, I think that's a big challenge with me getting postgrads is how do, how do we keep them motivated and say, Hey, you know, you really, I, I know you're really bright and you've accomplished all these things, but you can't take a lesser class load because then it doesn't look great when you're trying to get placed in these colleges. Yeah. And when you, you know, what I tell families too, as I said, look, if you do a postgrad, you can take a lighter, lighter load, mm -hmm. but if a prep school offers college classes, take them, you might get yeah. some credits and two worst case, even if you don't get credits, it will be a much more seamless transaction academically yeah. to your college life than it would be if you just took basket weaving. Right. Yeah. And same thing for basketball too. You're going to have an easier transition moving away from home for a postgrad year or for you know more than one year while your freshman classmates and teammates are struggling being away from mom and dad or their girlfriend for the first time, right. you're hit the ground running. So it's a seamless transaction, both emotionally on the basketball court and academically, if you do the right course load. And 
my God, if I just went to an academy and just played, you can't play all day and lift all days. What are you doing the rest of the time? You know, um, and some kids want that. So that, that's fine. Everyone's got to do their own thing. It's just, it's a constant education of people that they're two different worlds, right? They're both postgrad years, but they're two different entities. And uh, just be sure you know the difference between the two. Um, we'll finish up here. When you're not, uh, you know, being an advisor, teaching four classes, coaching, calling college coaches, looking at kids coming in, like, what are your, what are your hobbies when you have the time? <laughs> so I'm a big, I'm a big summer guy. And that's why I love coaching basketball is I don't do very many outdoor wintry activities. So I love being locked in the gym. A lot of my time, so my downtimes in the summer, uh, my family has a lake house out in Colchester, Vermont. So I spend a lot of time out there. I love to go camping. Um, I've recently convinced myself that hiking is a lot more fun than I used to remember it. Um, so all those, all those kind of things are, are kind of my, my interests. And I also have a very close group of friends that I've, I've been friends with since I was, you know, five and six years old. And somehow we always find something new to get into and try, try new activities. So I, I spend a lot of my time hanging out with them and, and trying to be outdoors. Oh, that sounds great. Where can people find you if they want to learn more information about you and New Hampton? Yeah. So if you go to the New Hampton school page, uh, newhampton.org and go to the athletics page um, and, and click on the varsity A basketball program, I have a little bit of background on myself and it actually has all my contact information, my, my phone number here at the school, uh, my email address. And then usually from there, you know, I, I start handing out my cell phone, but if I put my cell phone on there, uh, who knows what would happen to me, I'd probably disappear. Um, but that, that's a great way to find out more about me. Uh, and I'm always very transparent person. So if, if, if kids are interested, I'd, I'd love to connect with them and, and chat. Perfect. Well, Andrew, thanks so much for coming on today. I appreciate it. Learned a lot more about you. And I think you shared some valuable information today. And now you've got to keep the uh, the championship streak going. So you're you're one and zero now in championships. Anything less than that would be a failure. But uh, you, you've got some heavy hitters every year you're going up against. So uh... <laughs> yeah, we, we went from being the, the, the hunter to the hunted. So we'll see how we, we make that transition. It's a great, it's a great problem to have. So uh, Andrew Gale, head coach of New Hampton School in NEPSEC AAA located in New Hampshire. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. And thanks so much for tuning in to the Prep Athletics Podcast. If you like this interview and other prep school uh, related topics, go ahead and subscribe. And uh, we will uh, make sure that every new episode shows up when it, uh, when it drops. So thanks so much. Have a great day.